Hi. Uh, today I'd like to clarify uh, a theory that's listed in uh, on page 241 in the text, and it's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And what it actually does, this hypothesis, it, it, number one, it's an it's an old hypothesis. It's been around a long time, but the concept um, is still discussed. It describes the relationship between language and cognition. In other words, uh, thoughts uh, and language which determine thoughts, so it becomes uh, a type of linguistic determinism where language is determining the type experience people have. In other words, concept precedes experience. So who was Worf? Well, it was Benjamin Worf you see, he was born in 1897, and he died at a young age in 1941. He was an MIT graduate with a degree in chemical engineering, and he worked for the Hartford Fire Insurance Company as a fire prevention engineer. Now, he'd been offered, uh, he had uh, academic offers throughout his career, but he felt like uh, his job with the Hartford Fire Insurance um, allowed him to live a comfortable life and then his free time was spent studying uh, linguistics and he uh, described himself as an amateur scientist and uh, and I say he could have uh, uh, had a different career but this is the career he chose um, his background as a child he was a curious child that uh, he liked to solve puzzles and he read a lot. Um, he was raised as a Christian with a background in the Methodist faith. faith. Um, he started corresponding with scholars in, when, in his early 20s uh, from scholars in the fields of anthropology, archaeology, and linguistics. And then his really is his key connection in uh, academics was in 1931. He was a student at Yale University with uh, Professor Edward Sapir. So Worf uh, and Sapir um, uh, collaborated and started publishing. That's why these ideas are still around today and still being discussed because they were published. And Worf, like I said earlier, Worf actually died, died of cancer at age 44. So the problem with that um, when people began to criticize his thinking and and actually they were seeking uh, clarification of his ideas he, he was he was uh, no longer available to uh, to defend them so that's part of the problem all right let's talk about his theory now, the actual theory is that people have a need to make sense of the world and that they impose order as a way of making sense. So the main tool for organizing is language. So therefore, it made sense to Worf that linguistic patterns or language, the, words, the language that people use in thinking, these patterns determine what the individual perceives in the world. In other words, the person has an experience and it's their language that um, drives their perception of the experience and this is referred to as linguistic determinism. Um, in linguistic determinism uh, the language we use actually determines the way we view experience or even more importantly the way we interpret in experience. Uh, Worf came to this conclusion as a result of his study uh, with um, comparing English, was in anthropology uh, it's common to compare languages, so Worf was comparing English to Native American languages like Aztec, Mayan, and the Hopi. And uh, the way the process works is that some words seem to compare fairly well, and then you go through a process of doing that, and then it boils down to there's uh, words remaining that don't seem to be translatable and they represent the clues 
in the differences between the cultures because they're relating um, experiences that are interpreted different just like for example I think what is the Eskimo language has several words to describe snow where in English snow is snow but uh, <clears throat> they actually have uh, different words to describe different types of snow so it's a different interpretation of experience now uh, what I just described is what is considered to be the what's called the strong version of the theory there's also a weaker version of the theory that thought is merely affected by or influenced by our language and therefore thought and language or cognition and language are two sides of the same coin and this weaker version of uh, the theory is probably more accurate if uh, if there was a way to know. Uh, the structure of language determines a person's worldview. Uh, linguistic relativity, the distinctions of experience encoded in one language are unique to that language alone. That uh, part of Worf's beliefs. In other words, language determines the boundaries of experience. And the world is differently experienced and conceived in different language and conceived differently in different language communities. Another key idea here. All right, so criticisms of the theory. Well, it seemed to be politically correct during the 50s, 60s, and 70s to actually support Worf's theory. People were uh, going along with it. And then following that, uh, Noam Chomsky and Pinker, uh, who are um, who still are alive and uh, uh, published today, became uh, critics. And uh, the strong version of Worf's hypothesis implied the notion of absolute language non-translatability. And that was controversial, you know, and Worf saying, well, you can't translate languages, actually. And then both the strong version and the weak version um, have been rejected as false or what uh, what's referred to as not falsifiable. In other words, there doesn't really seem to be a way to test this theory. And therefore, if it's not testable, it can't be a scientific theory. It's really it's more pseudoscience. And that's where we came uh, at the conclusion today. But I wanted to talk through this. I think it's an interesting theory and we can have a discussion on this and see what you think as well. I have quite a few references supporting this. I have all these uh, cited in the transcript that I'll post along uh, with this video. And, uh, and you can see um, also I've got the text there, uh, Mats Matsumoto and Wong. And uh, that's it. That's uh, uh, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Thank you.